I think. Ooh. <laughs> um, I think I was slower than really? average, um, but I don't actually know. Hmm. Well, actually, average is a funny word because half the agents of this brokerage don't make a single dollar a year. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but if you count the agents who are actually working, right? I think I was on the slow, the late bloomer side. Um, I spent all of my life up to and including now hating salesmen. <laughs> and um, when Keller Williams Ironic. would teach the the doctrines of make them say no three times, I was like, screw you, Keller Williams. <laughs> and to be frank, I actually still feel that way about that particular doctrine. Yeah. But like, I, I made Keller prove it to me. You know what I mean? I didn't just jump in. Yeah. Um, had I jumped in, I think I would have made more money faster. Um, I'm okay with the route I took, but I, I can't endorse it. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> I'm, I'm a challenge everything guy. Mm -hmm. And I think it's made me a better salesman in the long run, but in the short run, that does not make you a lot of money. <laughs> so. <clears throat> How are you? How was your weekend? How was your weekend? Yeah. Good. I'm going to St. George. My niece, I'm going to she's visiting from the UK. Oh, cool. Oh, nice. So she has so, family who lives here? Yeah. Does she still live in the yeah. UK? Yeah, she, yeah, she still does. She was just visiting so. oh. I'm trying to get her to back. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you serve at? Uh, Colorado. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah I liked it. Did awesome. you? Everybody, everybody at this, even if you go to like Boise, Idaho, I know. everybody's yeah. like, it was the best yeah. ever. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I always tell people that Colorado is the mother. Let's this mouse pad. Tell you what, Ibex. They did a good job of getting a brand in everyone's office with the mouse pads. Because <laughs> who does mouse pads, right? Yeah, I know. I don't. I was just thinking that I don't even have one at home. All right, we will not leave the meeting as much as we may want to. Um, stop the share. Stop it. Ooh, there's my chin. <laughs> well, what chin I have? Let's go ahead and um, so unproficient with Max. So how's everyone's business going? Does anyone have any questions? It's going. Yeah. I feel like I'm having a hard time like I don't know explain this. Like there's so much that I've learned the past couple of weeks that I feel like I have a hard time getting like Same. You That's know? fair. Yeah. And then like there's times where I'm like, oh shoot, like I haven't really done a lot of lead generation because I'm mm -hmm. like case studies or <clears throat> you know, so I'm yeah. like <laughs> So I didn't yeah. do the case studies when I started. They sound fantastic, though. What are they? So basically, it's just like they give you like an MLS number, and then you have to just write like, for example, like the scenario. The scenario would be like write like an offer, like a floor. Yeah. So they give you like some yeah. parameters, and yeah. you have to write an offer. Yeah. Well, That's like, you awesome. Have to, like fill up the papers, like if you were like a grad. Yeah. So you want to understand. So. Okay. I need. I was going to talk to. How? Who do you talk to to get them? Um, I, are they like all online? Do you have the 30, 60, 90 checklists yet? Mm -mm. Okay, it's on that. It's just like there's like videos and is that in it. command? Like pro, pro U team. I don't know if it's oh, different. So I'm not Amber. on the team. Okay, I don't know if it's different. Like, you should look Amber, yeah, right? I don't so know maybe if she it's... has it set up differently. I don't know. I don't... I don't think she's mentored anybody in a really long time, she said. Okay. So I was like, oh, I'm a special one. <laughs> <laughs> or oh, I was yeah. just persistent enough. I don't know. Maybe I could just get access <laughs> but, to the 30, 60, 90 thing, like yeah. through like a team kind of thing. Yeah. I'll ask um, yeah, she Molly. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if it's like. So do you, I mean, I want to offer to help, but it sounds like you just need to connect with the, the case studies or, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to be better help than Amber. She's, she's the best person there is. 
Well, so what about scripts? Do you have you come across any scripts? Oh, I heard about that. I'm excited about it. <laughs> Are they yeah. in that 30, 60, 90 thing? I don't know. You don't know. Okay. I should have brought my thing with me. I'll ask but, Molly. Yeah. So I feel like there's like so much stuff that I don't like. I know. Well, I went to this open house on Saturday uh -huh. with the girl that does Amber's and she's like telling me all these things. And I was just like, <laughs> I don't yeah. know, just like brain overload. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, when they come in, do this. And then this is how I handle this. And like the whole thing. Anyway. Yeah. The only way you're going to get it is through reps just by doing it. I know, but it's just so overwhelming. No, I understand yeah. that that wasn't meant to be unsympathetic. Oh, no, no, no. I know. I understand. And I get that. But I'm like, how many times am I going to screw it up before I, I get it right? Mm -hmm. And like, then there's part of me that's like, what's more important? Like, where can I like, these things? Like, those are very important, you know? But like, right. really like, should I call people? Yeah, should you I know? do lead gen um, or? Yeah. Let's let's talk about that today because I actually think time management's, you're, you're going to have a lesson about time management, but let's take, let's take a couple minutes on that because I think that's a very important question. Okay, um, I don't know you. Tell me your name. Uh, my name is Joel. Joel? I just passed like last week. Awesome, congrats. Welcome, Joel. So is, is this like your first time? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Cool. That's awesome. I just passed like the 1st of August. So, well, I passed my okay. test in July, but I started the 1st of August. So you're not too far behind. Yeah. Yeah. My dad, my dad works here. And okay. my mom also works here. Oh, cool. So who are your parents? Um, my dad is John Buckner and my dad. And then my mom's uh, just a transaction coordinator. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I'm new, so I don't know. Yeah, I don't really know very many people. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Bringing your kid on must be really fun. <laughs> I have a two year old. He would be a terrible salesman. Nah, well, actually, good. he's a good negotiator, though. Right. They all he are. owns nothing, <laughs> and he's leveraged it into quite a bit. Right. So, never mind. He's a pretty good salesman. <laughs> Um, okay, well, on that note, let's start talking about negotiation. Okay. Um, yeah, and then, oh, no, 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 sorry. Let's take a minute. Let's talk about uh, lead gen and time management. So um, uh, you've done lessons on lead gen. Mm -hmm. Wait, I did the lesson on lead gen. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, I teach Ignite a fair bit, so I, I, I'm not a good tracker of it. Um, I think it's really important to lead gen every day. While you're learning, the problem is you're gonna run into these walls, right? Um, where it's like, well, I don't, I literally don't know what to do here. And that's when you should improve your education. And so what I would do is while you're doing case studies and stuff, I would, I would time block at least an hour of lead gen while you're going through Ignite. And I would try to go for the full three, which we talked about that, mm -hmm. um, where it's not three hours on the phone, but that's three hours doing prep, lead gen, follow up. Um, I, because learning case studies is not going to make you any money. Lead gen is going to make you money. Um, and we want you all to stay here and make money. So we want that too. Yeah. yeah. Um, so definitely, well, let me, I'll, let me tell you what I do and you can take this for whatever you think it's worth. This is apparently the, Stephen Covey teaches something like this, but I haven't read it. <laughs> And mine, I, I think mine is distinct from his. Um, so I was going to explain this two by two, but that's not actually important. Um, lead gen, marketing, uh, and then expertise. and then uh, service. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what I do is, uh, I've modified it a little bit from here, but this is a good starting point, is uh, these, in my opinion, are the four sectors of work. Uh, lead gen is when you are one-on-one -on -one talking to people about real estate, uh, trying to bring in their business. Marketing is when you are shouting to a large number of people via Facebook or an event or whatever. Um, expertise is where you are getting better at real estate. Um, I think this is the great forsaken quadrant. 
um, I think we are lousy in this industry with a ton of realtors who don't know what they're talking about, but have great personalities and build their careers on the back of that. And so it, to me, you have a moral duty to do this. Um, if you're not doing this, you're not a good realtor. Um, sharpen the saw, as I know Stephen Covey puts it. Uh, and then services, when you have clients, you should be servicing them. Um, you know, showings, or if they're like, if they're not active, I think you should think about, sorry, active was a really weird word there. If you have a seller or a buyer and you're not taking them a showings or you're not uh, negotiating contracts for them or whatever, I think every day you should at least think about them and go, what can I do to make their experience slightly better today? <clears throat> Sometimes the answer will honestly be nothing. Um, but like, if you have a listing, you're like, is there anything else I can do today to make this listing better marketed? Um, or if it's a buyer, can I go knock doors in a neighborhood that they were interested in but doesn't have any listings? Stuff like that. So I think every day you should be thinking about all of your clients. Um, even just to run a check, is there something I can do for them today and then plan it. Um, lead gen, you need to be doing every day. Ooh, I should have put this up top. That way they do the every day things. The problem is you don't have clients every day. Um, these two don't need to happen every day, but I think they need to at least happen a couple times a week. Um, and so if you're not doing deliberate, intentional Facebook posts a couple times a week, repent. Um, <laughs> and if you're not making yourself a better realtor a couple times a week, fix that. Um, so yeah, I like that. I should have moved service up here. I called these the dailies and these the weeklies. Huh. I just modified my own quadrant. <laughs> um, cool. That's my advice on time blocking. So let me ask you this. Yes. Somebody who has no clients like us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do this, most of your time, dead. right? So. <laughs> so focus more on lead gen and expertise and marketing, like kind of all three, like yeah. equally. What, yeah. What no, is, no, no, not equal. Uh, lead gen outreach. Okay. And so, if you were to put them in priority order, oh, I don't like that at all. Well, <laughs> maybe just it's spend lead gen and then expertise and marketing, kind of, and then these two are tied. Okay. <laughs> That's an X. That looks like an English X, right? Sure does. <laughs> Whatever you say. <laughs> um, and you could argue actually that these should be switched, but it just it depends on where you are in your business. Um, but if you have no clients, lead gen should be your top priority. Okay. Um, but since obviously you're new agents, if you're look, you're all going to ignite. Right. I mean, you're doing this. Yeah. Um, and then I, I think like, I forget who asked the question about scripts, but like working on scripts, mm -hmm. uh, something we started doing that I'd love to start up again is uh, we did role play practice on Friday mornings mm -hmm. where uh, we were doing it to like flex on each other with our listening uh, <laughs> appointments. Uh, but I actually would love to get some commercial role play done too. And so we should do that again. What are you all doing on Friday? Do you have ignite on Friday? Mm -mm. I'm free. Because we're we're done after oh. this. I mean, after Wednesday. Yeah. No. The end of what? our class. No. Really? This is the last class. You're no, tomorrow. Class? Our Wednesday. Oh. Yeah. Well, it's the last in our book. I don't know if there's more that we're supposed to be doing, but I think there's two yeah, books. Yeah. How long does Ignite last? Wait, maybe I don't know. What to... Ignore everything I said. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Either it's a big surprise they're going to spring on you, or more <laughs> likely I'm incorrectly remembering how. Well, I haven't seen the. Um... When I was in night, it was a binder like this, and we used maybe ten percent of it. Well, so we, we figured out a lot. We have this binder, but we didn't. We skipped like. Look, guys, your binder is cool, but my binder dwarfs your binder. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you win, you win the binder war. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. You're darn right. I do. <laughs> Um, okay. Before ignite. Before ignite. Okay, uh, that's not going to show up on the screen. That's me typing on my own laptop. Um, okay, so any other questions? Um, I do think lead gen related questions.
talk to your parents. <laughs> Who are you like on a team or are you being mentored by your dad or what do you do? Um, eventually, I'm not on any team yet. I haven't really got my fingerprints in yet, but um, I'm planning on joining Riley's team. Okay. Yeah. That's my team. Yeah. And then. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> Tell me your well, name again. I just forgot. Joel. Joel. Okay. I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, apologetically, a bunch of today is probably going to say all over your head. Um, but uh, I'm happy to talk to you about any lead gen or related topics, as is Riley. He gets paid for it. I don't. <laughs> so that's the big difference between us. <laughs> um, yes, because I, I want you to be taken care of. Yes. So we'll trade phone numbers before you leave the room. Sweet. Thank you. Okay. So how many people are on Riley's team? Hmm. I think he has. Does he? Does he? Is he the person that does like all the new? Yeah, he's probably the coach. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So there's a course that gets taught called the Certified Negotiation Expert Course. It's taught by realtors to realtors, and um, a very brief, I recommend that course highly, uh, but a very brief summary of it is whoever has the most information wins. Um, negotiation is when, when you have competing interests and if you know more about your side and the other side, you're going to be a better negotiator. Um, Yeah, I think that's really all there is to be said about that. The 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 principle of information, I call it. Oh, they put this back up here, but it still wiggles. It just doesn't wiggle as much. <laughs> okay, so when you are a practicing realtor, I think you should always be looking to have more information. Um, and it's not just about competing with the other party in a negotiation, although that's part of it. But like, if you if you have a better understanding of the market, you're going to make smarter moves. Um, if you have a better understanding of your client's interests, you're going to piss them off less often. Um, if you have a better understanding of the other party's interests, then you're going to find ways that the interests intersect. Like, you should always be looking to ask questions. So um, a, a very... Bleh, a uh, basic example of this is, I'm having trouble with English today, guys. <laughs> uh, a basic example of this is like when you're sending in an offer for a buyer, I always like to ask as many questions about the seller as I can. Admittedly, until recently, that was pretty hard to do because the listing agent didn't have time for you. They have 36 other buyers they're talking to. Um, but always, always call in when you send an offer and just ask them like, uh, some basic questions are, what's most important to the seller? 100% of the time, they're going to say money. Um, but they're, they might also throw in, oh, they need a quick move out or they need a lease back or, hello, welcome. Hey, thank you. Sorry, I'm late. You are forgiven. Um, but it, I mean, it could be a variety of things. It could be like a fair housing violation where they're like, they want to sell it to a nice family. Um, in which case, just shut up. Don't say another word after. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to get you in trouble. Um, <clears throat> Um, and then similarly, uh, when you are selling them, when you're representing the seller, when you have offers come in, for heaven's sake, always talk to the agent about the buyer. Of course, they're going to say glowing things about the buyer. Um, look up the uh, lending company that sent in the pre-qualification letter. Um, call the lender. And if they answer their phone, uh, if they don't answer their phone, that's already kind of alarming. Um, but ask them questions. Just ask you. It, all the questions you can think of, of every party you can think of, get all the information you can. Um, because with the seller, you're far more vulnerable if you get into a bad deal with a bad buyer, um, because the seller has very little power in the uh, in the contract. Um, so when you call the lender or the buyer, what do you say to them? What do you ask them? So, how strong is? How strong are they? Yeah, so uh, a couple things I like to ask. Uh, I'll just ask, tell me about the buyer. Um, usually the lender will also give glowing reports to the buyer because they, of course, want the buyer to go into contract. Right. Um, something I like to ask is, uh, what was the last transaction that you closed as a lender? 
Um, and if you really want to do your homework, then look that transaction up on the MLS and call that agent, that listing agent, and ask how the lender was. Um, because a, a bad lender can and will torch your deal. Um, so is that, do they find that offensive when you ask, like, what's the last deal you closed as a lender? I find that when they do, there's it's a reason. A problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Because the answer is yes, sometimes they do. And when they do, there's usually a reason they don't want you looking up their history, so. Okay. Um, another thing you can do is you can go on the MLS and you can stalk agents. I like to see how many listings that the listing agent has closed in the last 12 months. Um, same with buyer agents, you can see how many they've closed. Just get an idea of their experience level. And you do that um, on the MLS? Yeah, you can look up it. There's, uh, when you get the MLS, you got the three windows, you got the address, uh, agent, MLS number, you just type oh, everything in there. Okay. Uh, that ruined my perfect board. <laughs> okay. And then the second general principle, oh, sorry, any other questions about this? Okay. Yeah, I, I probably should have given you like a list of questions, but we're going to kind of get to that when we get to parties. Um, this is the term they use in business school, uh, the, does anyone want, I think I have Altoids, so I'll give an Altoid to anyone who can tell me what BATCA stands for, and if I don't have Altoids, you don't get one. I don't have any idea. All right, this is amazing. So. I used to call this the, the principle of power, who has more power in the negotiation, but I actually like this better. This is what they talk about when you get your um, MBA. So, best alternative. Why did I why did I commit to this crossword thing? Oh, I just officially did the E after it. Two, negotiated offer, or uh, sorry, uh, agreement. Oh my goodness, that looks terrible. So your BATMA is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Um, so at very, very minimum information you need is the BATMA. If, let's say in this case that we represent a buyer. Um, if this deal falls apart, what does our buyer do next? Like, are they moving here next week and they absolutely need to close now? Is this an investment for them and they don't care if they go for the next one? Those are two very different buyers. Um, similarly, Find out as best you can what the, the other party's data is, what the seller's data is. Um, are they moving into a house next month and they need this to close immediately? Or is this an investment for them that they can also take it at a relaxed pace? Um, I did one deal against the city of Ogden. And cities don't negotiate. <laughs> this, the way the negotiation went is the guy who worked for the city called me up and said, your client will do the following things. And that's, oh. that's how the city of Ogden negotiates. Wow. Uh, because they don't care, right? It was, yeah. Back then it was like a $70,000 house. It was different times. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but they, I mean, oh no, we won't get $70,000. What will the city of Ogden do, you know? Right. And so um, this is just a good way to sort of explore where the power is in the relationship. Um, and specifically, uh, this is why you want to know what's happening in the market. Um, so, like, do you guys know foreign seller buyer's market? We're pretty even. No, but um, it's, it is a time of great confusion. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would take arguments for buyer's market, but yeah, it's, we're, we're fairly balanced right now because we've been in the seller's market for the past 14 years. Can that be right? Is it really? No, that's years. not right. That's not right. That's, that's not right. That's 2008. That's like yeah, the no, worst. That's, that's when it was. Totally that was like happened. the big buyer's market. So it turned around 2011, 2012. I it didn't know. get I, crazy. I started in 2014 and we were in a seller's market back then. So but it didn't get super crazy till just after quarantine, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah. In, like uh, during 2020, it went nuts in ways that we all completely predicted wrong. Yeah. It's funny. Gary Keller gave a speech at the beginning of the pandemic. Like, we're doomed, folks. It's over. Pack it up. Go home. And then we had the best seller in market we've seen in history. Wow. <laughs> that, I'm, I'm exaggerating. Gary, Gary was fine. But he, uh, like everyone, was pretty sure we were going to see a crash during the pandemic. Um, yeah, that was a very weird, that was a very weird uh, convention. Um, 
why was it weird? Just because it was like the so, so unstable. Yeah, we were just at so the beginning know. of the pandemic. And I was like, so is civilization gonna end or what? Like right. and you know, if civilization ends, we're all out of jobs. Mm -hmm. Nobody needs real well, nobody needs in the post apocalypse. Job. Yeah. I don't think anybody even really needs salesmen. Like it will probably just be used for meat. <laughs> okay. So um, at a bare minimum, we need to know what what do, what is our party going to do if this offer falls apart? And what is the other party? What do we think they're going to do if the offer falls apart? Because that can change the tenor of the negotiation quite a bit. Um, next, we can talk about the parties that you deal with. This one, I think you guys do know. Uh, who do you have direct contact with during the negotiation? Well, either whoever you represent, uh -huh. or buyer, or your seller. So the client. Who else? Um, whoever made you, you made the offer to, uh -huh. or and maybe their lender. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so agents, right? You do actually have contact with their lender. Right? Think about that. We're going to set that aside because you don't typically have negotiations with lenders, but good job. Okay. Took my question and ran with it. Um, <laughs> we're also going to throw yourself in here. Uh, that would count as a trick question, is why I didn't expect that answer. Um, but you also have the interest. So, <clears throat> um, oh, you know what I should have done? Do this all higgledy piggledy. I'm really excited about this topic, guys. Um, no, let's, let's jump into this first. So we're gonna talk about interests and in a second, we're gonna differentiate interest from positions, okay? Um, well, no, I'll tell you right now. An interest is, I wanna save as much money as possible or I wanna make as much money as possible. Um, and a position is, I want to make $450,000. Do you understand the difference? Mm -hmm. um, everyone has interests, not everyone actually has positions and we'll jump into that a little bit later. So uh, let's actually divide this because buyers and sellers are different. Obviously, you're not going to have direct contact with the other um, client, uh, except in very rare cases. So in this case, we're teaching about buying and selling all of them. So uh, what are the interests a buyer has? Um, they want to buy the property for the least amount possible. Okay, that was actually two things, and I love both of them. They want to close. And then uh, they want to save money. Okay, uh, I think you can guarantee that every buyer has these interests. Um, let's go on to like guarantee interest. What's, uh, what do we know the seller wants? What do you want to close to? Uh -huh. Make the most money. Sorry, I'm asking stupid questions, but these will get less stupid in a second. Um, okay, this is the other agent in the transaction. What do we know they want? They want to close. Everybody wants to close. Yeah, everyone wants to close. You want to close. Good job. Um, okay, let's let's go into interests that they might have. Okay, this is not necessarily, but usually, um, what's something we would expect buyers to possibly want? As far as the way the deal goes, yeah, for the We're negotiation. The transaction, yeah. So they want to save money, and maybe they want like I don't know, like some concessions of like are, are you talking about that kind of thing, like sure. closing yeah, yeah. costs. I'm, I'm not going for any specific answers. Okay, but so the they want when I was being sneaky, but I'm done being sneaky. Okay, <laughs> so they want concessions. They want you know like closing costs and or a quick close or whatever, mm, yeah, whatever okay. so they need. Close. Um, sometimes they want a slow close, but that's pretty rare. And that line inspections pay my seller. Okay. So like that would be under concessions of like. Yeah, I'm gonna put those under because uh, those are all correct concessions, repairs. Uh, we'll call vendors or closing. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those will go under the umbrella of save money. Um, and then uh, sellers. Here's one I'm gonna throw to you because this is one I never would have guessed as a new agent. Sellers want to feel like their house is valued. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, this is for owner occupants, right? For investors, they usually don't care. They look at a spreadsheet and they're good to go. Um, 
valued. And similarly, uh, depending on the market, I think this might swap around it a little bit, but uh, buyers want to feel heard or validated. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I've had a quadrillion deals go kind of sideways because the buyer and seller felt like the other party was being unfair. Um, and it's like, there's this, this inherent idea of fairness that everyone wants that actually has nothing to do with money. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll, we'll get into that more in a little bit. Um, what's another thing that I, I would argue every agent wants this. What's another, obviously the agent wants to be able to close. What else do they want? They want money. Sure. I mean, they want, you know, they want the best that they can make on that transaction. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You want to go smoothly too. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. smooth transaction. That's a fantastic one. And they want both parties to be happy. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think all agents want both parties to be happy, but they definitely want their own client to be happy. Um, and so this is, I think this is greatly undervalued in negotiations. Every agent wants to look like a rock star to their client. Um, and we'll talk about some methods for that and how you take advantage of that. Similarly, you probably want all the same things as the other agent. Um, I mean, maybe you don't want your clients to be happy. Maybe you're sort of masochistic or sadistic, excuse me. I got those words confused. Um, okay. I feel like I'm asking so many leading easy questions, guys. But here's another one. How do we find out which of these probable things? Like, is there top? Yeah, well, not even the one. How do we know what, how do we know for sure if they want a quick closing or if they want a slow closing? Just ask questions. And just ask questions. When? Um, I would say right when you take the, like, right when you start working with them. Yeah. If you're the buyer's agent, right when you start working with them. So at the earliest possible point in your relationship with them, you want to ask their expectations. Um, they, most of your clients have worked with another realtor before they worked with you. And there's a reason they're not working with that realtor again. Um, I wouldn't say that explicitly because there are a lot of first time home buyers, of course, but, um, when you're just talking to them, be very open and clear with them. Be like, what do you want? What will make this transaction smooth for you? What will make you a raving fan by the end of this transaction? And they'll tell you. Um, and a lot of the time they'll be correct. Um, I also think it's worthwhile when you start the, the deal to sort of reconnect with your buyer and say, okay, let's talk about this offer. What makes this offer a win for you? Uh, and then they'll probably start giving you position. It's like, we need, we need to make $20,000. That's a very small amount of money. I guess they're selling short amount of money. Um, and then with the other party, I think a good way to phrase it when you talk to other agent is like, what what does your seller want from this transaction? Like, how do we make them feel valued and heard? Or again, this works for seller or buyer. That one doesn't matter. Um, but just like really dig in, go deep. Like, what's what's your client's motivation for this? Like, let's make sure that we can match and exceed all their expectations. And I always throw this in with talking about their agents. And let's make sure that you look like a rock star. Like, I literally say those words. Do you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Challenge me, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, like, so you see, you say that to them. Yeah, I always, so whenever I'm talking to the agent, I'm like, and yeah, we're going to make sure that you look like a rock star. Sometimes I say hero. So I guess, I guess you called me out. Okay. <laughs> that was not my intention. <laughs> um, yeah, and we'll come, we'll come back to that. Okay. Can I erase all this amazingly well written and clearly? shown stuff <laughs> have you guys been taught how to study the market i think becca taught you um, not really didn't she teach she taught make you receive offers right yeah we didn't oh. really talk about studying the market interesting Okay. Did we have yeah, one? That's like actually a question. Like, where, like, where do you go to like look at? Yeah. Like, like, yeah. I kind of remember the first class he he kind of touched on it. He touched on it, like he said, "Yeah, look at this MLS." 
and then like, yeah this was so Netflix, but like it wasn't like it wasn't like here's where you go and this is what you do like yeah. i need i need like study the market for idiots yeah, yes, I'm going to give you that. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm also, uh, just to be clear, this is a huge topic. I'm going to give you the top drop of the bucket. Okay. Um, many of us have wasted years of our lives studying this idea. So, <clears throat> And now you all get the amazing privilege of seeing my login name. Oh, whoops, hold on. This is the not incognito one. I don't share my passwords. Come back incognito window. How do I make my incognito window? Come back. How do I do this? No, why are you doing the rainbow wheel? Oh, this is the worst day of my life, guys. It's the wheel of death. Oh, there's my chin again. I do not look good from this angle. Let's go ahead and just tidy that up. Nobody yeah. does. Yeah, well, I, I but I'm 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 a subset of that. Um oh there we go. There we go. Boom. We're gonna watch The Greatest Showman. Is it playing right now? It is. All right, we'll fix that later. That's. I figured if we needed to fill time, we just watch a feature-length movie. <laughs> I'm, I'm that substitute teacher you remember in high school. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not a substitute. I signed up for this. So <laughs> I wanted to watch The Greatest Showman with all of you. Um, let me check my password because I never remember my passwords. They're always very funny. Though I can tell you that. <laughs> Oh yeah, Hellcav. Because I'm Kevin Helps. First thirty of last, first thirty of first. I think that's a great one. Send that verification code. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like so I've actually talked to, to a couple of friends about real estate, and like, I feel like I just kind of want it with like the market. <laughs> you yeah. Know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, this is like what I see, so I kind of like assume that like, I'm getting it. But I'm like, I want to know, like, okay, like, I want to be like more active. Yeah. Accurate, you know yeah. What I'm saying? Yeah. So. so, what kind of questions are your friends asking? This is a great topic. Like, is it a good time for me to like start looking for a house? Yeah. Or, Tell know? me what you say. I'm curious. I just say, I'm like, yeah, like, it is a good time. You know, like, it's a good time. It's just, I tell them that, like, you know, because of interest rates, it's better to like save. And mm -hmm. then go into it, like because that's what my husband and I are doing. Sure. Like, so you have like a you know like a better like payment each month. Mm -hmm. And then they've also asked like, hey, like what like are houses like selling? Like what is it like the market look like? And like so I'm like, yeah, like there's like there's quite a few houses on the market right now. Things are starting to even out with like awesome. buyers and sellers. Okay. So yeah, but then like yeah. And if they ask anything more, then I'm like. Let me get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah, that's how I am. I'm going to give you. So those then are I like. like okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. Well, that and that's great. Um, you do want to be careful guessing on answers to those questions. Yeah. Uh, that can come back and bite you. But that, those, those are both okay answers. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of is it the right time to be looking? Um, it's complicated. I know, yeah. <laughs> uh, so what I always tell people is the right time for you to move is when you want to move. Okay. Um, if someone is specifically asking, I don't want to move, I want to buy an, in uh, an investment property in Utah, I'd say, did you know there are 49 other states? Um, Utah is not awesome for investing right now, at least not in the residential side. Commercial is doing pretty well. Um, but most of your friends are probably asking, when do they want to move? Yeah. Uh, and the answer is when you want to move. You do want to have saved up probably about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars, and so I, you could say that. But I'd actually give that amount and say I'd get up to fifteen twenty thousand, or even just connect them with your lender because your lender might have better options for them than that. The lender might have zero down options. Um, because if you buy now, one of two things is going to happen. I guess one of three things. Uh, either interest rates will stay the same and prices will slowly crawl up and then you'll be glad you bought it. That's the least likely. Um, possibly interest rates will go up and then you'll be extremely grateful that you bought now because interest rates go up and prices are probably still crawling up. Um, or interest rates will go down and then glory be, you can refinance and lower your payment. Um, and so there's not really a compelling argument to not go now. Uh, which is not quite the same as saying that now is the right time to be lucky. Do, do you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, 
And so the the catchy thing everyone is saying right now in real estate is um, marry the house, date the rate. Um, the house you're going to be in for a long time, the interest rate will change. Um, and if it changes in a good way, just refinance. Booyah. Boom. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what's the market doing, saying it's a balanced market is not wrong. The, the, it, that's another one where it's a little complicated where this market is doing things we really haven't seen happen before. But the closest analog we have is that, yeah, it's a balanced market. Um, cool. Now I'm going to show you how to learn those answers yourself. Um, so if you just log into Utah Real Estate and scroll the bottom here, this is going to be a quick snapshot of what's happening in the market. Um, I want to show you my spreadsheet, but we're like two logins away from doing that. So I'm not going to. But if you ever want to see my spreadsheet, it's extremely dorky and has so much more information than this. Uh, so the average days on market right now, houses are staying on the market for 29 days before going under contract. Um, the average list price, I actually can't read that with my beady little eyes, but I think this is 607. Um, and I cannot read that. That looks like three zeros to my horrible eyes. 600,000. Boom. You know what, you know what I, I pretend to know how to do is use computers. Let's see. Um, actually, I don't know how to zoom in on a Mac. Yeah, whatever, who cares? Okay, so that's your quick little, if you follow this and you see like how these numbers are changing, um, I'm actually a little surprised by 29, uh, but these numbers are probably gonna go up slowly. And then this number is kind of hard to predict. So those statistics are, oh, so the entire market, that's the entire market for the state of Utah? Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, uh, more accurately for what's on this MLS, but okay. most people don't care about the difference. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then as you can see, you can narrow it in. So if you like wanted to see what's happening in Salt Lake County, you get those numbers. Um, and then something that we don't have time to go into, but I want you to be aware of is if you go to the statistics tab, here's a bunch of different reports you can run on any chunk of the market you want. And this is what's gonna make you an expert. Um, what I would say is you should get very comfortable with the sales per month report is uh, just once a month, check in here. Uh, I don't think we have any, that's clear because I'm not a bit Salt Lake in there. So this is the entire state of Utah. We're not discriminating for any property type. I think you should discriminate on both of those vectors, but that's not what this class is about. <laughs> so I do understand It takes forever. The MLS is very slow. And then this shows you all the data I just showed you, but per month. So now you can see that, um, wait, why is that different? Well, I don't have time to dissect that. But <laughs> huh, that's odd. I've been trying to find out why that was. Uh, but so anyway, you can see in general prices creep upward. I think we had a little dip somewhere in here, but I cannot read those numbers. Um, and then. Ugh. Looks like their dip came in July. That sounds right. Just about 10,000. This number is wrong, but it's still okay as a number. This is trying to guess. Uh, on average, are prices uh, houses going for above or below what they're being listed at? And that number sometimes, right? They calculate it in a stupid way, but it's good enough, and that's what most realtors use. So, um, yeah. Anyway, play around with your statistics tab, and have fun and become experts. Well, let's go back to talking about negotiation, you nerds. Okay. Sorry, you had a question. Well, I'm just saying where it says up at the top, median. Um, dollars per square foot. That's how much the average is per square foot for each for these homes, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Just want to make sure. I love that number, but be careful with it. It's very powerful when used correctly, like fire. Um, it's great when you have two very similar properties. If you look at the price per square foot, that's actually a pretty good way to comparison. If you're looking at two different properties, stop looking at that number. Um, it's a lot of realtors walk into that trap. Uh, because like price per square foot, as you go up in size, it like starts up here. And then as you head toward mid-sized houses, it creeps up a little bit as you go into luxury houses. Mm -hmm. um, because it's just the 
the way people buy houses, like you're paying a premium to get into the house at all. Yeah. Um, and so be careful with that number, but when you're looking at two very similar properties, it's awesome. Okay. Okay. Any other questions on this? Cool. Let's just move on to negotiation, which is theoretically what this class is about. <laughs> okay. We're going to talk about three negotiating methods. The Dean Crandall School of Negotiation. We all know who Dean Crandall is, I trust. Mm -hmm. Okay, but he taught me this and it's fine. It's really good, especially when you start now because it's easy. Um, I went to a class taught by a guy named Ed Zane, and these are actually the first three letters of his name, and that's deliberately a capital S. So he taught a class about negotiation, he had some fun ideas. He's what I would call a classic negotiator. Um, and we'll get into that one a little bit because there's some strengths in this method. And then have you heard of the book, Getting to Yes? I've heard of it, but I haven't read it. Okay. Getting to Yes uh, believes itself to be the Bible of negotiation. And I don't think they're wrong. Um, that looks like G plus Y, who cares? Uh, so in short, what do we call this the honest development? Dean Crandall is not a fan of playing games during negotiations. Oh, you know what? Uh, he's got that sign in his office, play nice in the sandbox. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I would describe this for a negotiation. Uh, no tricks, no nonsense. You just are very direct. We'll talk about that in a second. Like Sainz is what I would call chess negotiation, but no, we're going to call it poker negotiation. So that's um, exam is a strong proponent of make sure you have more information than the other party. Um, and we'll talk about what that means. Um, by the way, if it sounds like I'm knocking on any of these, I'm not. I think these are three perfectly valid approaches. It's just a question of style and what you want to do. Um, and then getting to yes is what I call cooperative negotiation. Okay. So, in short, the Dean Crandall method, you find out from your buyer what they want, and then you tell the seller, right? You say, we want this. Uh, sorry, or so I, I'm going to keep acting like we're repping the buyer because it makes it easier. So, and then you just tell the seller, it's like, we need the price to come down to X, and can you do it? And then the seller will say, most likely, no. But we can do this. You can go back to your buyer and say, can you actually do this? And eventually they'll either you'll have a big yes or a big no. Um, it's really simple. There's no tricks about it. Um, you do know you don't disclose information about your client without their permission. We're all comfortable with that, right? And so if your buyer tells you, um, we're, you know, the house uh, is listed for 400, we could even go up to 420, though. And you're like, blaze it. Amazing meme, Kevin. Um, <laughs> you don't then go to the seller and say, we can go up to 420. What you do is say to the buyer, can I tell the seller that? Um, and they'll probably say no. Mm -hmm. um, but just, you don't, you don't play games with the other party. You just, you just tell them what you want and then, you know, go from there. Um, the advantage of this is it's easy. Um, it keeps your relationship with the other party good, usually. Um, there is the tricky situation, and you're going to get into this with any of these methods, where you have a client that's being unreasonable, but you have a legal duty to protect their interests, um, and that never feels good. But you can always then talk to the agent after the deal, like, sorry about that. I hated that client. <laughs> Throw your clients on the bus, great habit. Definitely do that all the time. After, clients, after it closes. Yeah, <laughs> not before. Like, clients never find out about it. It right. never comes back to bite. You definitely <laughs> brag on the client. Um, we can do these pluses, uh, minuses. This can actually lead to weaker outcomes in terms of money. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get into the poker method. Okay, I'm, I'm trying not to make these too complicated. Do you, do you understand what I'm going for here? 
Mm -hmm. I honestly, honestly recommend for your first couple of deals, do this. Um, it's, it's fine. It's a great way to negotiate. One of the best agents you know does it. Um, it's, it's fine. Okay. So the Exane Poker Method. I can't remember what his last name was. His first name was so distracting. Anyway, okay. So this is where you've heard, like this is the, the type of negotiation people would still on television. Um, it's uh, make the other party give their position. You heard don't speak first in the negotiation. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that? Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't agree with that. But what this method is saying is don't declare your position first. Um, so make them give position. Uh, so a story about this. I had a deal with Homie. And I have um, a personal hatred of that company. I know, shocking. <laughs> uh, and what I do is whenever I do a deal with Homie, um, I've never had a Homie buyer come to me, but I've closed five where they were the listing. Four. Um, and what I do is I do a CMA on the property. And because I'm a spiteful creep, um, I try to make sure that the seller does not save a dime um, by hiring Homie. And so I calculate what they saved by paying homies lower commission. Uh, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to make sure that they lose money. <laughs> this, is, this is awful. <laughs> and so I did a deal in Springville. Springville, uh, that's how cool people say Springville. Right. Uh, and we went under contract and I did the math and I was like, shoot, they're actually breaking even. Um, and so we went to inspection, like, I'll just get them in the inspection. This is, this is a very unhealthy way to approach it. Um, and the inspection went fine. There was very, very little wrong. With, I mean, you know, it was, a, it was like a 15-year-old property. So it had, like, issues, but not issues. Not something that, in any other case, I would have pushed on. But in this one, I went to my client and I said, look, I don't think we have any ground to stand on. Can I go after them anyway? And he said, yeah, do whatever you want. And so... Um, <laughs> I sent them, you're gonna, agents are gonna do this to you. Uh, I send them the entire inspection report, the 16 page report. Cause I know these guys are doing like 20 deals at once. They don't have time to read the whole report. And I said, um, as you can see, there are tons of problems with the property. To make this smooth, we're just asking for a $5,000 concession. Um, oh, and you have paid my 3% uh, my commission um, because they were offering, I think 1% or whatever. Um, and so, the next day, they, they should not have agreed to any of those terms. Homie calls me up the next day. And he's like, uh, he chews me out for like 10 minutes. He's like, you are the worst. These are unreasonable. You agreed to this BAC and you went under contract with us. I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh. In my heart the whole time, I'm like, ah, shucks. Well, I tried. Um, and then uh, he hung up. And then they sent me the accepted addendum. Really? Like, cool. Get chewed out for 15 minutes, get five thousand dollars. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good rate, guys. <laughs> um, and so what I'm sure he wanted is he wanted me to offer to withdraw the addendum, but I didn't. I never, I never do that. Um, because the other concept is always take, take the best offer. And what I mean by this is um there's this thing that happens, I think it's a Utah phenomenon, but I've never practiced outside of Utah, where we, we try to be very polite to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and they'll do this thing like, oh, we could come down three to $5,000, I guess. What you should always hear is we will come down $5,000. Uh, when they give you two options, you always assume that you're taking the better one. Um, I think that's actually good advice regardless of which of these methods you espouse. Um, and the homie guy didn't ask me for anything. The best offer was nothing. Apparently, it was accepted. So he just wanted to chew you out. I'm pretty sure he wanted me to volunteer to withdraw the amendment because, you know, he was being a bulldog negotiator, making $20 an hour or whatever they make over there. So you just stayed silent. I, I just I just nodded along. Yeah, all right. Okay, okay, okay. Um, and then, yeah, they said the accepted amendment. So suck it, nerd. Because he wasn't, he wasn't getting paid enough to care. I can't really blame him. So um, downside of this, it can be damaging to the relationship. 
that if agents think you've hoodwinked them, that's going to hurt your relationship and your ability to do business with them in the future. And then if you're not careful with it, it can uh, makes you look like untrustworthy. Like anytime the other side thinks you're hiding information from them, like you're intentionally trying to keep them out of the uh, information that would, they need for the deal, then you've, you've torpedoed your ability to have cooperative negotiation. With them. From that point on, you are adversaries. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not, Keller Williams culture is very much about win-win or no deal. Uh, and so you wanna be careful that you don't step in the line of like deceiving the other party because that's, that's not okay. Is that, is that clear? Um, okay. Then the getting to yes, these guys are so proud of it. Um, the big thing here is uh, deal with problem and people separately. So uh, this is where you want to take into account like the other agents' interests, right? This is where you say, I want to make sure you look like a rock star. Um, because, you know, you could come in with this Vulcan attitude of like, who cares if your feelings are hurt? We're just trying to negotiate a good deal for our clients. Um, and, and sure, from a logical standpoint, that makes sense. But if the other agent is annoyed at you or, or feels like you're not hearing them out, or if your client doesn't feel like you're hearing them out, even though you're getting them a good deal, then you are damaging your ability to continue the deal. Um, it's most deals break because of emotional issues, something that could have been solved. Like, like logically, you can have both parties getting a good deal, but because emotionally they feel like they've been taken advantage of, the deal falls apart. And so um, the getting to yes method uh, takes into account, you need to look at the problem and the players. And those are two separate things and you need to address both. Does that make sense? And one way to do that is what we've already talked about. Oops. Interests, not positions. Um, and this can be tricky when in real estate there's, you know, if the deal goes up by $1, then the buyer lost and the seller won to the amount of $1, right? And so it's tricky, but the getting to yes philosophy is you've got this line and this is the, the price line. And up here is the maximum amount that the buyer is willing to pay. And down here is the minimum amount that the seller is willing to sell for. Both of these are myths, but don't worry about that. Um, it's good enough as an abstract idea. And then the getting to yes philosophy is anywhere in here is a successful deal. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so you could, yeah. So this has similar bonuses to the Dean Crandall method in that it's good for the relationship, both with you and the agent. And the weakness is similar to the Dean Crandall method. It can lead to a weaker outcome. Just theoretically, if you played poker with them, instead of ending here, you could have ended here. You know. Okay. Any questions about these? This is pretty much the end of the theory portion of the class. We're going to analyze an episode of The Office, and then we'll all high five each other. I don't know. We're going to ice cream. No, I've got a meeting after this, but we can get ice cream later, everyone. Um, but yeah, do you want to dig into any of these? This was all like thirty thousand foot views. Because so, do you yeah. do you subscribe to one particular one, or do you kind of do like a mash of? depending upon the situation of all three, what's your, what's your personal? So I, I use all three of these uh, sometimes. I'm falling out of love with the poker method. Mm -hmm. uh, not because it doesn't work, but it takes a lot of effort mm -hmm. and navigating these potential downfalls. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of work. Um, in terms of where you end up on the line, this one's gonna get you far closer to your client's end of the tug of war. Um, but, okay, I think part of what we're selling as salesmen 
is stories. Mm -hmm. And that sounds really shady. So hang out with me for a second. Stupid Josh Barrett. <laughs> That's the topic of today's lesson. <laughs> oh no, have you been there? <laughs> How embarrassing. Um, you sound like somebody that you're impersonating somebody. I don't know. I'm never not impersonating somebody. Um, okay, consider the difference between these two logically identical statements. Um, the sellers will in come down $3,000 in price, but they won't fix the roof. The seller won't fix the roof, but they will come down $3,000 in price. I just said the exact same thing twice, but it felt different, right? Mm -hmm. And obviously you should never ever lie to your client. You have, you know, you've sworn an oath or whatever, you've signed a contract. You should never ever lie to any party in the transaction. However, you should make your client feel good about the transaction. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so- Just walk out at any point. You just like rambles. <laughs> the longer you listen to me, the worse you get as salesman. Um, <laughs> Which is why I'm thinking about that. I've come closer to anywhere in here as a win, right? Because the buyer has declared, I will be happy anywhere to the left of this line. And the seller's declared, I'll be happy anywhere to the right of this line. So why are we squabbling, right? Also, these lines are illusions. But that, again, we're talking very advanced nonsense there. That is not an ignite lesson. Um, and so that's where I've come around to. However, I absolutely understand because I used to be this guy. He's like, no, yeah, sure, anywhere in there is a win, but this is more of a win for a buyer, but this is more of a win for the seller. The problem is everything pricing is so ephemeral. Negotiations are so uh, turbulent and volatile that you can't actually know where these lines are mm -hmm. or what the home is worth, right? Um, it's, it's, it's a variable artistic number. One of the things that annoyed me so much when I started here, I was talking to uh, another agent I think she left the business, maybe because of this conversation. Um, and we were talking about pricing a home. And I don't remember how we got here, but she said, if you had a $20 bill, would you sell it for less than $20? And that's stupid. $20 bill is one of the only things in the universe that has a set value. That's what makes them, that's what makes them $20 bills. Also, they, don't, they also don't have a set value, but ignore that too. Mm -hmm. Um, $20 is going down to the 5%. Since yeah, you get it. <laughs> yeah, so if $20 bills can't hold their value, what chance do homes have? So that's that's my rant. Um, now I know it sounds like I'm crapping on this method, but I'm not trying to do that either. I think there is this... No, here's what I want to say. I think you should understand all three of these. Um, because... Regardless if you want to put yourself into one camp or if you want to somehow synthesize all three, on some of these are mutually exclusive, um, you are going to run into all three of these from the other party. Um, there's, oh my gosh, there's so much shenanigans. Like the one I told you where they send you the entire inspection report and like a, a hit list of like 32 items, I guarantee you that's going to happen to you. It's, oh, I can see it's, that's a problem. And it's just. Not hard to do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so this happened in my last transaction and I took it as, as non-information. Um, I just went to my uh, sellers and I said, they want this much. What do you want to do about it? That was, I was training a new agent with that transaction. So we were sticking pretty hard to this school. Um, the other thing that happened in that transaction, this one's actually kind of interesting. Uh, the... It was in June, July, June. Uh, we had this like universal price drop of about $20,000 where everything, they all started dropping the price because we like suddenly slammed into the wall of the seller's market. And it wasn't, it wasn't a gradual thing. It was like over one weekend, everybody dropped their price. We went on a contract like one day before that happened. And so we talked to the seller and we said, look, the reality is if this deal breaks, talking about the BATNA, um, if this deal breaks, we have to lower our price $20,000. And so when they came in with a repair request of $10,000, I personally thought it was unreasonable. But the fact of the matter is, if they even looked at the market, they'd be like, never mind, we're walking. Um, and so I told my sellers that. It's like, look, I don't think this is a reasonable repair request, but we're still winning over what would happen if we went back to market. Uh, and so that's, that's how I handled that. 
basically, when they send you a, a whole litany of requests, it's it's irrelevant. The only thing that's relevant is what are they asking for. Uh, like the homie deal is another example, where he had all these complaints about how I was behaving as an agent, but he didn't ask for anything. So the only relevant detail was nothing. It was a waste of a call. <laughs> um, cool. Any other questions about this? Okay. Cool. Let's uh, let's let's judge uh, some characters in the office. No, let's do this one first. Except apparently this has been playing the whole time, so I probably have to back a bunch of times. Here we go. Are we all familiar with this show? All right. So uh, Hugh Jackman's character is trying to convince uh, Zach Efron. Is that his last name? Zach Efron's character to join him in the circus. And what we're going to do, I actually love this song uh, because it jumps into the steps of negotiation really well. Um, but he also makes some mistakes. So we're going to listen to Hugh Jackman's verse and then we're going to critique him. And then we'll listen to Zach Efron's response. And then we'll decide who the winner is. Will we hear this? I don't know. No, that's saying no sound. Why? Okay, there's no one on Zoom. We're gonna watch on my laptop. Sorry. I told you I'd show you a movie, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just had a negotiation with gravity. Yeah, and there's no one on Zoom. So there's no one to have the sound removed. So let's just tap this down. Okay. Can everyone see this screen? Because then the lyrics are going to be on here. And they sing in sort of a quick staccato style. So you'll need to see them. Okay, here we go. Oh, wait, let's make sure my sound's up. The song also kind of slaps, but that's a different topic. Okay, what did Hugh do? How do we break down his tactics and how he tried to convince Zac Efron to join the circus? Hugh, Hugh. He played on his maybe sense of um, feeling like no adventure, like yeah, like his, his sense of being caged in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's. Uh, can I erase this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, Kevin, we are not like taking pictures of your board notes. That's pretty <laughs> arrogant of you to assume. Um, we just all wrote it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. So I'm going to call that an appeal to emotion. Okay. Uh, which I actually uh, think it can be good or bad. In this case, I think he does it pretty well. Okay. Uh, there's one other thing I'm thinking he did pretty well, but I want to hear what you guys thought first. Any other thoughts on what he did well or poorly? No. Okay. Uh, he did not declare a position, right? He said, I want you to join me. That's an interest. Uh, in Later in the song, they'll talk about payment. Um, but in this case, he, he did not actually put any of that out there. He just said, my interest is I want you to join me, which I think was pretty strong. Um, one negative. He makes a buttload of assumptions about Zac Efron's character, which then uh, come back to bite in, in the butt in verse two. So let's jump into Zach's response. Don't you 
really handsome. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do we think is Zach's response besides how handsome he is? <laughs> They're both quite handsome. Um, I saw this before I saw High School Musical mm -hmm. and I didn't know they were the same person. Oh, and, really? Yeah, and then later on, I was like, that was Zac Efron. <laughs> he's bad in High School Musical. Yeah. But that, yeah. that guy can sing. Mm -hmm. Like, he's, he's got pipes. All right, what do we think is Zach's response? The characters have names, but I don't remember them. Like, Barnum and Bailey, maybe? I don't know. Ooh, I'm good. You're dumb for thinking. Like, yeah. You know my life, bro. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and so he, 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 he torpedoes the assumptions. We'll just abbreviate that ass. So he torpedoes ass. <laughs> I'm, I'm, in the end, I'm 13 years old, okay? Uh, assumptions. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, anything else? Um, he kind of puts him in his place where he talks about he's like fine with his uptown role he gets to play. And he yes! goes with the swells and he's going to yeah. the pink. Picking up the peanuts to him. Yeah. Okay. So he kind of he kind of gets his little dig in there. Yeah, love it. So uh, in in the vernacular of the class, I would say he declares his background. Yes. He says, he, he says you've misjudged my background. Is I would be perfectly happy to walk out of here and not a part of your circus. Um, I think he messes one thing up. We didn't really talk about this specifically, but do you have any thoughts on what he did poorly? Um, well, he kind of didn't really leave anything open for negotiation. Yes, exactly. He just like said it and then like, like he was going to walk away and not be done with it. Yeah, he declared his position. Mm -hmm. um, and as we can see, there clearly is wiggle room in that position. So he misrepresented his interest by declaring a position. Okay, now we're going to get through the rest of the song because they have a bunch of back and forth nonsense. And um, then we'll watch The Office. <laughs> hear the rest you'll just have to look up the song yourself um okay so i think uh, any other comments on on the daniel ma there i think it's interesting that zach takes power when he actually declares his position um which is he says i am i'm intrigued is the word he used but there's a huge social cost to joining you that's an interest he's not saying I, it has to be this right and he takes power in the negotiation right after that line. And um, so good job, good job, greatest showman. And then they start banding numbers around. There's actually a terrible way to negotiate, but it happens all the time in real estate. So I can't pretend it's unrealistic. Where is that? I, I, like you'll have conversations with the other side that really sound like that. It's like 500, 499, 499, 5, 499, 25. That's so. a reverse option. Yeah, that's uh, I, I'm trying to think what my record is. Before going under contract, I think my record is eight addenda because they just uh, refused to do anything over the phone. Um, 
oh yeah, here's a random tip that doesn't fit anywhere else in the lesson. Uh, negotiate on the phone, just do That's one awesome. addendum. Yeah, if, you, if there's a reason not to trust the other party, get everything in writing, but it just, you can go, you can go back and forth so much. Um, and they don't want to write a million addenda. You don't want to write a million addenda. So just sort it out on the phone. So for example, let's say you, you offer 500 and they're like, we can't take less than 520. You say, okay, I'll talk to my client. Like, um, no, it's more complicated than that. Let's actually talk about this. Okay. And then we'll watch the office guys, I promise. <laughs> um, Okay. Have all of you filled out a rep seat? Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, once you, okay, okay, let's put it this way. Once you go under contract, which party has the ability to end the contract without negative repercussions for most of it? Well, I should say negative financial repercussions. Okay. I so mean, it uh, depends. Okay. Like if it's before the deadlines? Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, so then the buyer can the buyer. do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we've got, uh, we're not going to review what these are, but we've got due diligence, we've got financing and appraisal, and then we've got settlement, which isn't relevant to what we're talking about right now. Um, I don't expect you to know what these are, although you probably do from real estate school, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm about an idea of them. Well, you're welcome to jump in if you want, but I expect this one to be a little over your head, and that's fine. I'm really glad you're here. Um, okay. So in the reps, you had earnest money, eight thousand dollars. Okay. Um, prior to due diligence, the buyer says uh, we had a bad dream about this house. We're pulling out. What happens to earnest money? Take it back. They get it back. The seller says, hey, we had a bad dream. We're pulling out of the deal. What happens to the earnest money? They give it back. Go back and the seller pays them an equal amount. And so um, if the seller pulls out at any point, there are going to be damages. Probably earnest money, buyer could sue, but that's rare. Um, whereas if the buyer pulls out here for any reason or here for financial reasons, then they're fine. They get their earnest money back. They've taken no damage. The seller has taken damage because they spent time off the market um, and they get nothing back for that time off the market. So when you look at Batman's, once you're under contract, the buyer just natively has more power. Um, there are things that can change that in the contract. We're not talking about the exceptions. We're just talking about the rules right now. Um, and so why did I bring this up? Because we're talking about agenda. Right. Okay. Okay. So if you are the buyer agent, and if you are the listening agent, you're actually gonna have different behaviors, which is why we brought this up. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, so if I am the buyer agent, and we have offered 500, and the listening agent says, um, can they do 520? I say, probably, send me the counter. Um, because my goal as a buyer agent is go under contract as fast as possible, because then they can't be talking to other parties, they have to talk to us first. I mean, they can talk to other parties, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, we, we have the last word on whether this contract is gonna close. If I'm the listing agent and I'm in the same conversation, and they say, send me a counter. If I have any other buyers on the table, I say, no, first tell me if they're gonna accept the counter. Because my goal is to not go under contract until I have the information I need, right? Like as the buyer agent, you've got plenty of time to find out more information. You can just pull out, nobody's hurt, ha ha, screw you. Uh, with the listing agent, if you go into contact with a bad buyer, you're taking tons of damage. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, yeah, in general, as a buyer agent, push for counter offers. In general, for a listing agent, push for an agreement prior to the counter offer. Um, most likely, if you're dealing with a good agent, they're going to push you to get that information first, and that's totally fair. Don't just go to your buyer and say, well, we accept 520. Okay. Good? Okay. Okay. Well, you're going to miss the office. <laughs> Wouldn't do this again. If you could all go to kwemail.com. I'm going for my uh, certified instructor. I know you guys have already done it. Do it again. I'll do it again because you taught again. Yeah. It's a different class. 
and it doesn't track who you are in any way. So <laughs> you can totally pad this. I was actually talking to, well, believe me, that's occurred to me. I can just go online and do it myself in about 10 minutes, but. Um, My region is. Uh, Utah, oh, right? Okay. I hope. Yeah, Utah, oh. sorry. Um, <laughs> Okay, I like how you apologize to me. Sorry. How, is, how dare you? What is my event type for my market center? Yeah, it's uh, is, is it night the on there? Let's let me go through this with you. It's been a little bit for me. Okay. In case you're wondering, Joel, it's very normal to watch TV in these. <laughs> So market center in person. That's the one I want. Yeah. Okay. The name of the course is Ignite 18, Negotiate Offers. Instructor name is not on list. It's at the very bottom. Instructor not in drop down question mark. And then type in my name, which is Everyone's giving me flawless reviews. So if you don't give me flawless reviews, you really won't fit in the group. <laughs> but you don't want to force us. Say what? You don't want to force us. No, I would never imagine doing such a thing. And then I can't tell you how to fill out the rest. That would be immoral. But I'll give you two minutes while I, I don't know, surf Facebook, and then we're going to judge an office negotiation. Ooh, we really ran up on our time here. No, oh, we got to 1130, right? Yep. Okay. KWU, yeah. Keller Williams University. Is it for my market center? Yeah. Yeah. Is it, sorry, I have lots of questions. Yeah. So it's the team, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. No, I'm heavily motivated to get you to fill it out right. So I'm happy to answer yeah. questions. Okay. And then Cabot, what uh, Kevin helps. 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 Okay. I'm not on the list, so it's oh. not in drop down. Okay. So many. No, you're fine. So, oh, wait. Yeah, never mind. Okay. Phew, what a relief. Uh, I was I so sick it. of answering your questions. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of questions, like all the time. All right, I'm going to queue up the office. What was the name of the course? Uh, it's Ignite 18, Negotiate the Deal. Sunday when I'm not so long-winded. I'm going to teach this course and we're going to use the Michael Scott, David Wallace negotiation, even though that one is cut out over several scenes across the episode. Um, and also, I don't think it teaches any interesting principles, just that Charles Minor makes a bunch of screw-ups, but I think they're obvious screw-ups because Dwight literally tries to give him information and he's like, no, screw you. And that information would have turned the negotiation. Come on, Charles Minor. <laughs> I'm in the Charles Minor is bad at his job camp. I think he was a bad hire, and I don't think he did anything good for Debbie Duffin. So, <laughs> but instead, this is a negotiation that I think is fascinating. 
because this is one where, well, no, I'm not going to pass judgment on it yet. Although I think it's pretty clear who wins this one. So in this episode, Pam has declared herself office manager. She has done this fraudulently. She is not the office manager. And she's been pretending that this happened before the company got purchased. And so Gabe, who represents the company, is now going to confront her about it. And they're going to have a negotiation. Are we all, do we all know this episode? Did I need to give that background? No, that's fine. Okay. I don't want you to ton, but. Of course. The problem, unfortunately, is about the office administration. I have gone through everything for the past three years. There is nothing that says that your office administrator. You can turn it off. So I can't. There's no paperwork yeah. at all. Although, like, unlikely things happen all the time. My best friend in high school, she went to Australia, Canberra, I think, and she met this guy who lived only two streets away from her in America. Yeah. I don't accuse her of anything. I just want everything to be back. I don't want to say. Say it. Say that I'm lying. Or say I have the job. Make a definitive statement, Gabe. Statements of such nature while they have their place are overused in a competitive business. Okay. Let me know if you need a new chair or anything that an office administrator can handle. Okay. All right. So let's analyze this one really, really quick. What, what did you notice? Who makes good moves? Who makes bad moves? I think it's fairly obvious who wins that negotiation. I don't think, I don't think that one's a, a wash. <laughs> that was not a win-win. Um, what, what did we notice? This one's pretty brief. Uh, oh, wait, sorry. Uh, uh, I forgot this one. The dude, the guy. Gabe. Gabe. He didn't like say like a statement, like yep. this is what needs to be done, you know, like, yeah. So this I think is interesting because Gabe does state his interests really well. Um, and so this is, I think, a weakness of taking the uh, getting to yes position too far. Sorry, that was, that sentence made no sense. The, the getting to yes philosophy, of interest, not positions, can be taken to an extreme where it hurts you. And this is Gabe demonstrating that because he very clearly says, um, I, he never says he doesn't think she's actually office administrator. He says, I just want things to go back to the way they should be. Um, that's an interest. Uh, but he never takes a position, even though that's all he had to do. And so if nobody's taking a position, you're, uh, you're screwing up. Okay. What else do we notice? So one thing I noticed, or maybe I missed it, but he, she kind of goes off on this old tangent about her friend that, yeah. like, she, like, totally, like, a left field, like, oh, my friend moved to, to um, Australia, blah, 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 and then he's, like, uh, okay. Yeah. So she, like, I, I don't know, kind of, like, something shiny, look over here. Yeah. And then, so, so I don't know what you call that. Yeah, I would call it deflection. <laughs> deflection. I think that's a pretty bad tactic. Um, where obviously that's not going to throw him off, right? Although with her previous boss, it might have worked. So I see why she would go to it. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that he, he comes in with interest and she tries to dismiss. Mm -hmm. um, the, ooh, I like dismiss better. A dismissal. Um, and this does happen in negotiation. That's obviously a comedy show doing it. But... Um, where the other party will try and tell you why what you think is unimportant or wrong. Um, and don't do that. That just, that's not a good way to go for it. Anything else we noticed? There's not a lot more to this one, honestly. Well, so she didn't really ever say, like, she made him, she pinned him to saying, say it, say I'm not exactly. the office manager. So she took, took, she took a position. She demanded a position. She demanded a position. Because she correctly read him that he wasn't willing to take a position, mm -hmm. and she exploited that. To me, this is the negotiation I had with Helen. Um, except I never demanded a position. I just refused to give one. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a case where I think she absolutely exploits this weakness of never taking a position. Um, 
yeah, I don't think there's much more to this one, but if you guys saw anything else, we can put it on the board. Cool. Yeah, all right. Uh, so let's talk about leveling up your business. You have your license, right, Joel? Uh, um, oh, okay. So you can't you can't lead generate yet. I uh, don't think so. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. That wasn't a question. Did you, did you take the, your testers through? Um, Does that mean you took your courses through? No, I took my courses through the party. Wait. Then I, I took my test at Pearson. And so I haven't gotten, I haven't sent like my records to the division yet. I have my fingerprints yet. Okay, cool. Do not lead generate that. Don't do it, Joel. Okay. <laughs> uh, for the rest of you, how's your lead gen going? Is there anything to do to help you focus or, or do anything better? I'm working on getting all my contacts into command. I just barely got access to command like end of last week. Awesome. So that's my focus. Okay. But on the side, like I, you know, like I'll think, oh, I need to write so into a little note, like the for one of yeah. my touches. So I've been kind of doing that. Do you have? Um, I think that's great. Uh, do you have any kind of goal or benchmark for how many notes or anything like that? Um, no, but I should set that. Um, do you know about importing your contacts? Now? Are you putting them in by hand? Yeah, from like from my phone. So uh, you can get them from your phone. Are you on Google or Apple? Okay. okay. I don't know how to do it from Apple, but I'm sure you can. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> You're on Google. The, yeah, I think so. Okay. This is Samsung. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's Google. Um, let me see if Alex Latu is here. Oh, I should have brought my. Gosh, that would be so up. much better. Because yeah, I started doing it too. Yes. Like, it takes a minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're doing it by hand. Stop. Yeah, so Stop I, it. I didn't bring my laptop, though. I didn't bring uh, my laptop. But they, I, actually, you can do it in the day, area if you know your password. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm like, yeah. I feel like, yeah. I only feel like all my A. Mm -hmm. I, I know. I, I think I'm on, like, C. I'm like, this is going to be forever. Yeah. Are you able to access your contacts on a computer? Like, is there an Apple version of Google Contacts? Um, I don't know. I'll have to go figure that out. Okay. Don't go anywhere. What would do? I'm not your mom. I don't even have very many, but 